Good morning and a very warm welcome to Thinking Out Loud at HOK. It's great to see you all again and we hope you're keeping well and happy. My name is Farah and I'm the marketing principal for HOK's London studio. And also, can I just apologise? I've been suffering from laryngitis for six weeks, so my voice is just a little bit um, poor at the moment. And so to our speaker this morning, Femi growing up in South London was always intrigued at how things worked. His father was an electrical engineer, and whilst his civil servant mother thought he would be a doctor, Femi always thought about how things came together. And by the age of 12, he knew that he would want to be an architect. Whilst being good at maths, he was also very creative. The profession he decided that would allow him to be both creative and yet apply his logical mind was architecture. Attending Wandsworth School in Southfields, he played rugby and also sang in the famous Wandsworth Schoolboys Choir. Femi also quietly confided that his choir had supported Pavarotti. <laughs> Attending the Welsh School of Architecture at Cardiff University, he studied parts one, two and three. By the end of part one, Femi was also playing at the Harlequins. His first job came from the clubhouse after a very successful day on the field. Chatting to a lady after the rugby match, he was offered a job at Bloomer Tweedell here in London. Femi has also worked at Frederick Gibbard Partnership, RHWL and RPW before joining HOK in 1999. Femi's career has spanned a number of significant buildings, including the Ministry of Defence, HQ. Femi has also designed hotels, including one at Euro Disney in Paris. He has also worked on a number of courthouses and his current projects include Kew Gardens and Snaresbrook Crown Court. Outside of work, Femi is chair of the Reba Advisory Group, Architects for Change, a part three tutor at the Bartlett School of Architecture, where he is also a visiting lecturer. Femi is also a professional examiner at Cambridge University. He takes an active role in mentoring and supporting students who aspire to become architects. In his spare time, he coaches at his local rugby club and is also a passionate Arsenal supporter. And so, without further ado, I'm really very happy to introduce the very charming and very stylish Femi Oranzia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Farah, and thank all of you for uh, making the effort to be here this morning. As I look back over my last 25 years as an architect, it is quite intriguing that having initially been engrossed in the world of designing hotels and resorts, I find myself immersed in civic institutions. Thanks, Andrew. I've worked on public sector projects, large and small. Many of them are listed. The one common theme is that all these buildings, places, and spaces seek to serve a civic function, be they government departmental offices, courthouses, or museums. These beautiful buildings illustrate how our society has developed. Sadly, over the last few years, it seems that we are not designing and investing in as many civic buildings, and therefore, the question that I ask you this morning, is there still a role for grand gestures of civic architecture? So what do we mean by grand gestures and how is civic architecture defined? Well, the word civic comes from the Latin word civis, a word for a citizen of ancient Rome, and the word civic relates to a town or city, especially its administration or municipality. Civic architecture came about as a result in a shift in power from a feudal system to representatives of the citizens. For the Greeks, civic life was sustained by spaces called agora. These agori were surrounded by public buildings and temples and were a place where social justice was obtained through open debate rather than imperial 
or regal mandate. Likewise, when the Romans conquered the Greek Empire, they created forums, or fora for those of you who are versed in Latin, and public participation took place in open squares. The buildings surrounding these spaces were designed to be intimidating, austere, and represent authority. A Greek classical design language was used, and with the advances of Roman engineering and innovation, the arch and concrete, as well as the use of materials such as stone, marble, a new type of architecture was formed. Domes, colonnades, they were the order of the day. Buildings such as the Colosseum, temples, triumphal arches, and even Roman baths became the representation of civic architecture. Fast forward to the 16th century, and we find that the language of civic architecture began to appear in buildings that signified importance and wealth. The Bank of Monte de Pecci de Siena in Tuscany is one of the oldest banks in the world and is some of the earliest representations of this language. This language of civic architecture continued through the 18th and 19th century. Even our own Bank of England, originally designed by Sir John Soane in the 18th century and replaced by Sir Herbert Baker in the 1920s, was inspired by the ancient world. Being built from stone, brick, and marble, the bank signifies strength, permanence, and wealth. Many of the buildings that people recognize as civic architecture today are those that are classically designed. The importance of civic gestures. Civic buildings are central landmarks in our city or town centers. They often include libraries, town halls, opera houses, public squares, government buildings, even post offices, and other significant landmarks such as bridges. I would like to suggest that civic buildings are important to our towns and cities. These bring people together around our shared values. They form the social infrastructure of our communities. The success of the civic architecture created was defined by how we experience the institutional values and the collective aspiration of civilization. This was manifested through the physical presence of the building's design. These buildings were created and the surrounding public realm became the foundations of a civil society and the cornerstone of our democracy. Civic institutions help to define and identify citizens and instill a sense of pride. Civic architecture provides comfort in the public spaces and encourages the community, young and old, recently arrived and established members to use these places. Communities come together to conduct business, settle disagreements, seek justice, socialize, and be entertained. Opera houses and other music venues like concert houses, theatres were located in the civic quarter, sometimes even inside the city hall. Close by would be other civic buildings, the courthouse, the fire station, the main police station, although this one's a slightly more significant police station, and the city council offices, all located along the civic table. In the early 20th century, civic architecture again followed the revived classical tradition. The old war office by William Chambers, the grade two star listed building, was specially designed as the government's headquarters for the war office. It is located in Whitehall, within striking distance of the cenotaph and with a perfect view of the changing of the guards across the road. This is one of the finest examples of Edwardian civic architecture, a place where Winston Churchill once had an office, but now it's in the process of being converted into a five-star luxury hotel and apartment block. This is due to the fact that the Ministry of Defense could no longer afford to maintain the building. However, the upside is that in a few years' time, the public will be able to enjoy afternoon tea in the former Secretary of State's offices. Thinking back to the cities of the past, 
Many major civic and commercial activities often took place in grand buildings. With this visibility and with the weight of bricks, stone and mortar, there was also a sense of accountability. And with this, dare I say it, came social responsibility. Even when we look back to the past and explore these grand gestures, it's obvious, especially from a planning perspective, that these buildings were planned clearly and efficiently. Their expression was monumental. A common theme of the following buildings is that they were all won through design competitions. Manchester Central Library, Swansea's Guild Hall, Salford Civic Centre, Watford Town Hall, Cambridge Guild Hall, and Bromley Town Hall. Just a few examples. The winning formula was a plan of a grand entrance and staircase leading up to the council chamber that was on the first floor, normally located to the rear of the building, with the committee rooms, mayor's parlor, all arranged along the front. Extensive use of wood veneer, marble facings, original light fittings, and specially designed furniture meant that these civic buildings offered up the growing status of local government. Now, perhaps with the modernist movement, synonymous with the designs of Le Corbusier, a new era where glass, steel, and reinforced concrete was increasingly used. Perhaps another interpretation of instilling civic pride, one could argue, was demonstrated by the architecture of fascism. This was also a modernist representation, resembling architecture of the ancient Romans with simplicity and symmetry. These buildings were designed to create a sense of awe and intimidation. It displayed strength, power, and supposed pride in their movement. Take a look at this building, a fantastic example of the international modernist style of the 1930s. Its name was the Casa del Faccio, and its sole purpose when constructed was to act as a backdrop to the mass fascist rallies during Mussolini's regime. Today, it would be a desirable building to live or work in if it wasn't for the fact that it is now the provincial headquarters of the local police force. Anyway, as I take you on this journey, the question I ask, have we moved away from the genesis of civic architecture? The Festival of Britain in 1951 to commemorate the centenary of the Great Exhibition began the rejuvenation of the South Bank to celebrate the arts, science, industry and design. It provided a civic anchor to the people of Britain, a feeling that the country was on the road to recovery after World War II. The Royal Festival Hall is all that remains from that exhibition, and as we all know, it has recently been sympathetically refurbished. But taking a look along the whole stretch of the embankment, this staggering mass of arts and civic buildings is one of Europe's largest cultural centers. Sadly, however, it seems that our post-war buildings are not as revered, and there is a feeling that the public undervalue the architectural civil response of, the, of that preceding generation. Coming back to the premise that the idea of celebrating and engaging with our civic buildings has diminished, I ask you, why is this? Well, I suggest that a number of functions that some civic buildings used to serve no longer take place in these buildings. Also, as we know, there has been a lack of funding made available by successive governments to keep these buildings maintained. Many of the civic and commercial functions, all the things that make up, govern, administer, and support society, can now take place on the internet. With the phenomenal pace of technology, as we all know, even banking takes place with the use of apps on our smartphones. We can pay our taxes online, get our passports, driving license. Even politicians do a lot of their work online, if their Twitter account is anything to go by. The internet, for all its positive attributes, has ironically led to many of our civic buildings becoming redundant. However, even the mighty internet needs buildings to house the switches, wires, and banks of hard drives to function. Buildings such as 
the London Internet Exchange on the edge of Canary Wharf, perhaps a very important building for society. But would you define that as civic? However, in New York City, on the Avenue of the Americas, there is this building. It's a beautiful 1930s, 27-story um, Art Deco building. And it was converted and renovated to house this very function. The obvious question is, can we afford to invest in grand gestures of architecture? Well, we still need community centers. We still need our libraries, our museums, our hospitals, and our religious buildings. More importantly, we need these public spaces that, sur that surround these buildings to bring our communities together. We need our social infrastructure. Maybe only the best of the best is worth preserving. The St. Pancras Hotel by George Gilbert Scott is much loved now, but if it had not been for Sir John Betjeman and the Victoria Society, this grand building would have been lost. The restoration and renewal of the Palace of Westminster at between four and six billion pounds sounds outrageous, and there are some who believe that a new parliament building should be built in Liverpool, Manchester, or even Birmingham. This bold move would equalize the economy, shift the political center of gravity to the middle of the country, and save money in the process. However, the Palace of Westminster is a grade one listed building in a World Heritage Site that attracts millions of visitors and pounds every year to London and the UK. So perhaps the investment is worth the renovation. Taking a look across the world, some countries have decided that it is more prestigious to invest and create a new capital city, thereby building a new civic architectural language altogether. Oscar Nehemiah's futuristic civic buildings in Brasilia, which helped to create a new sense of collective identity and hope for the Brazilian people. What's happened to them now? Or take Nigeria, my ancestral home. Lagos was the capital city, and in 1976, blessed with huge oil reserves, the military government decided to create a new capital independent of the three major ethnic groups. So Abuja was created in the geographical center of Nigeria. This new city was master planned by an American consortium, but its core complex was designed by Kenzo Tange. Buildings like the Senate House, all the ministry and departmental buildings, the Supreme Court, embassies, Central Mosque, main Christian church, all relocated to Abuja, leaving the previous buildings behind to be refurbished, redeveloped, or just left to rack and ruin. Now, one of the buildings that was left behind is the National Theatre in Lagos. It's actually one of my favorite buildings in, in Nigeria. It was designed for the Pan-African Festival of the Arts and Culture, FESTAC, in the 1970s. It was designed to resemble a military hat, although I actually think it looks like a traditional Nigerian hat. Unfortunately, it was not maintained, and the last that I heard is that it has been sold to become a retail mall. Sad, but at least the building remains as a symbol of Pan-Africanism. As I canter across the world this morning, another example is Nur Sultan, the capital city of Kazakhstan that was previously Almaty until 1997. Nur Sultan is a planned city, master planned by Kisho Kurugawa. And some of the civic buildings created include the Palace of Peace and Reconciliation by Foster and Partners, the Concert Hall by Manfredi Nicoletti, the Khan Shatir Entertainment Center, again by Foster and Partners. Money is clearly no object for these stunning examples of civic architecture. But I wonder what future architects will think when they look back at these grand gestures that were designed by star architects and produced by purveyors of parametric buildings. Gravity defined and sculpturally seductive, yes, or just were they pandering to produce a design solution for a moment of excitement? Will neo-futurism as a star survive? Interestingly, when there is a reason to celebrate and announce a new dawn in the UK, new civic architecture has appeared. With the Greater London Authority, when it came into being in the year 2000, this function could not move back into County Hall because the building had been sold. 
and was now home to a hotel, an aquarium, an amusement arcade. And anyway, there's a Ferris wheel in front of it. I remember walking into this building to organize my grant for university after passing my A-levels. The reason I'm standing here today is largely due to the maintenance grants given by the Inner London Educational Authority, we used to call it ILIA, that used to operate out of County Hall. One of the first major projects that I worked on after becoming an architect was to transform this building into a Marriott Hotel. The sense of irony is not lost on me. So, with a newly formed GLA, a new symbol for London was needed, and Foster Partners won the competition to design City Hall. They seem to get around a lot, don't they? Um, an egg-shape inspired building, maybe as a reference to the renaissance of local government for London after the Iron Lady abolished it in 1986. So, whether you like it or not, the building and its surroundings speak of civic quality. It's in a great location, it's home to the London Assembly, and is visited by Londoners and, tourism, and tourists alike. The building has transparency written all over it. Well, it is a glass building. Outside the building, there is an amphitheater which is used in the summer months for open-air performances and concerts. Our current Prime Minister, who is known for choosing his words carefully, affectionately referred to the building as the glass gonad. <laughs> Funny, you might think. However, his comment is not so original, as his predecessor called it a glass testicle. Perhaps a more appropriate description is the headlamp or just the beacon of democracy. An interesting aspect is that this building has only been leased for 25 years and is part of the More London development, which is owned by the QAT Sovereign Wealth Fund. So what will happen when the lease runs out? Anyway, as I begin to sum up my thoughts, a natural question that comes to mind is, Will the 21st century witness the equivalent of Victorian civic pride? Will we have philanthropists like Andrew Carnegie, the Scottish-American steel industrialist, who gave away 350 million US dollars in his lifetime? That's around 65 billion US dollars in today's money to build over 2,500 libraries across the world. Maybe it will be Bill Gates, who has already donated close to 5 billion, and I say this because I heard him say once that no man can become rich without himself enriching others. The man who dies rich dies disgraced. I wonder if the future of civic architecture lies in smaller scale buildings. We still want a civic heart to our towns and cities. Local government still needs to be present and visible to its people we still need a sense of identity and pride in our society. Several back office functions can take place in the background, so the larger architectural representations are no longer needed. Also, we know that civic buildings overall are expensive to build and quite expensive to maintain, and their formal spaces often remain empty for most of the time. Our civic heritage builders may no longer be fit for purpose, but yet, with some ingenuity, we can find ways of retaining and repurposing them. For example, just a short walk away is Marylebone Town Hall that was designed by Sir Edwin Cooper. Within the city of Westminster, it is a popular location for weddings. Several celebrities have chosen to tie the knot there. A number of them have enjoyed the location so much that they've returned to do it again. However, this building was in extensive need of refurbishment and the number of functions that previously took place needed to be relocated. But now, after a sympathetic refurbishment, the wedding registry has been retained and the grand space is renovated, whilst other areas of the building have been leased to the London Business School. Is the answer that it's not so much about grand buildings anymore and perhaps we should be placing greater emphasis on creating more public spaces for our citizens so that they can come together, enjoy, and celebrate our cultural differences. The future of democratic societies rests on celebrating shared values and on making the use of shared spaces. Creating places, spaces, and buildings which seek to give back to the citizens. 
The civic architecture of the future will perhaps help to heal and also move our society forward. Thank you for listening to me. I'm happy to take on any questions if you have any. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? That was really fascinating. Um, what, I, what I think is really interesting about the subject and the way you handled it was that this kind of, it, it's like a section through society um, in four dimensions, it's time. And it represents, or it's a way of looking at how things have changed in mm -hmm. society, right? And so I, I kind of wonder if a place like the Apple Store is the new civic architecture. It's a place, because, I mean, let's face it, most of the people there aren't even shopping, they could do it online. They're there to look, to interact, talk to the geniuses and all of that. Um, similarly, when you see Gen Z and the way that, well, millennials as well, the way that they interact in their world, which is, which is very more collaborative, perhaps a lot of it being online. I just wonder what they would create as civic architecture, what represents them as a, the new culture, the new society, and how maybe the bricks and mortar need to change. Thank you. Um, you're quite right. You know, um, it's, I think in a way buildings, they're just the base. It's finding things and spaces for people to come together that then creates this new civic identity. So the Apple store or places where a lot of people convene. Football clubs, football matches, you know, 60,000 people turning up every other Saturday to watch the mighty Arsenal win. Occasionally, occasionally draw, sometimes lose, but the coming together around a shared, a shared passion. And I think, yeah, you know, we've got to start thinking that it's not just about grand buildings anymore. It's about things that bring people together. So I think I, I, think I agree with you uh, in, a, in a way. Yes, thank you. I thought it was a really interesting talk. Um, I don't know whether it's a, a question or, or more of an observation, but um, I think a lot of local authorities have started buying sort of areas within their town centres to sort of take ownership. And I just wonder whether that's kind of where things are moving. You were talking about creating those spaces where people can meet and socialise. Mm. So I, I just wonder whether that's kind of the next evolution. Oh, I think so, because, you know, I, and what's quite interesting is, is that with um, power being devolved down and local authorities taking back control and taking ownership, they then can now start to drive ways in bringing their societies together. I think it's great. And the fact that they can actually borrow the money almost at nil percent interest allows them to do that because I suppose the, the main thing is how do we afford it? That's, but if a, if a local authority takes it on board and makes it multifunctional and multi-purpose, you know, the, the rugby club that I, I, I coach at, we play rugby on a Saturday, but for the other six days, there are functions that are happening that you, would, that you used to expect in, you know, community halls. That's all happening around clubs now. So, yeah, I think it, more authority should be taking that leap of faith and refurbishing and redeveloping their own stock to try and bring people back together. Um, I work on so many projects all the time. Um, I suppose right now, my favorite project is the one I'm working on. <laughs> but, well, I, I, you know, I'm working on a queue at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, and that's, again, trying to do something really, really interesting on a World Heritage site. Um, great clients, aren't you, Patrick? <laughs> um, but yes, we, you know, great, great projects, but projects that actually bring people um, a, a shared sense of value, you know, that when we complete it, that everyone can look at it and then say, this is where, uh, you know, this is where our efforts have, have gone in and, and isn't, it, isn't it right? Patrick. Thanks, Ferry. How much do you think that these buildings are considered grand by virtue of their history? and this is in retrospect, or do you think most of those were built 
in the knowledge that they were grand at the time. So I'm thinking that maybe the buildings being built today may in future be considered grand, but we just don't know it now. There are, there are one or two examples where I think, you know, we're, we're starting to think that that will be a grand building in a few years' time. I, I'm going to mention one off the bat, only because I was involved in it, the Francis Crick Institute, the Cathedral of Science. It's a fantastic building. When you look at it, that says that, you know, this is a building where things happen, but it's a building that was devised to try and find cures for man's ills. So that will be the next civic piece of architecture. Not many people get to go into it, unfortunately. There is a public zone, but in answer to your question, I think the Victorians did want to leave a legacy. I think they, you know, that's why some of those buildings are still around today, because when you look at them, they do speak of a bygone area, but one that was great, it shows strength, and permits because they're still here. And that may be just the building processes that we use back in the Victorian times compared to, you know, the, the post-war um, as, 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 as in a way lasted. Do you think that, I also think that grand buildings were built with the, uh, the idea of being run at the beginning, but do you think that the society now is um, um, educated enough or prepared to have grand buildings? Because for example, uh, with Chandigarh in India, yes. people robbed that place. So if you give the grand building to a wrong, wrong environment, within the wrong environment, it will never be appreciated. So maybe it's about educating the society and, and um, building that building within them. And I think, you know, coming back to, the, to, to your point, that, and, and what was quite interesting when I was actually researching this talk is, that developing countries still need to announce themselves on the world stage, and therefore, they're the ones who are, dare I say, are producing grand gestures. And for us, we already have a number of grand buildings. What we're looking at now are, uh, are buildings and projects for, you know, people to play basketball in, to play bingo, to just to come together. So, yes, are we slightly more advanced than those developing nations? Yes. But at some point in time, we cannot forget that we still need to have representations just to continue to show how well developed we are as, as, as a society. Absolutely fascinating talk. I just wondered how green issues are incorporated into your thinking. For, for your buildings? I think sustainability and producing green buildings has to be the top of every architect's agenda. Um, you know, I, we as designers, they say that we, you know, we contribute to a number of uh, the, these issues, but as an architect, I've signed up to the Carbon Neutral Initiative. I think most members of the design profession are doing so. So as we continue to design new buildings, we always have to be thinking, how can we make this building as carbon neutral as possible? I mean, it's interesting that the RIBA um, Sterling Prize just a couple of days ago was the housing scheme. You know, that is where we're going. We're celebrating the normal now and not just, you know, the, the, the special or the one-off. Femi, thank you very much. It was very provocative. Um, I had two observations. One was just to underline the point that the gentleman on my left here made about these sort of you know, the, the Apple Store, places like that, these temples, I suppose they are the new marketplace. And I think it was interesting you ended up with a slide of Granary Square. I mean, a few weeks ago, I used to work near there, but a few weeks ago, I think I stopped off and I spent a couple of hours in Cold Drops Yard. And what was really pleasant about the experience, there was this huge, large place, which just felt where you could just sit and you could be, and you could choose not to engage with the shops or you could play in the, in the, in the is it the Tom Heatherwick, um, <laughs> Um, sculpture, moving sculptures like a child. And the, probably the, and the biggest sort of temple, I think, was the new Samsung building. Um, I, I, the other observation I wanted to make, and you may well know about this, is that the Kaluska Banking Foundation launched an inquiry several years ago now into the civic role of arts and cultural organizations. And so a lot of us have been in that conversation about what is our role as arts or cultural or spaces. And I think probably one of the themes is, is about opening up. And I think probably the, the example that comes most immediately to mind is the Royal Opera House and their whole open up project, which completely 
um, changed that sense, your first encounter with that space, i.e. that you don't have to, <laughs> to buy a ticket for the opera, you can just simply walk into the space and it feels open and welcoming. And I think I sense this is a theme that is coming more and more um, into, the, into the conversation. And the, but the last point I want to make very quickly is this, that I think that that notion, that the language, you know, civic architecture or the, role, the notion of civic is something that I think is discussed by people in these kind of forums, but I don't feel it's the language of the street. Um, the language of the street. Yes, it's in, in this forum, um, but maybe they, I'm not saying, maybe they, they do, but they don't articulate it. Because when I hear young people, they're more concerned about their community centers, the place where they can go to make music. That's still civic, but maybe it's just not articulated. Maybe we've got to bring it down a level. Because it's the, you know, we are talking about the generation Zs, really. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm already over the hill. <laughs> but yeah, maybe we've got to start trying to engage more. But that's what we do. We try and go out, most architects and most architecture practices, and I can, but I am going to speak for, about us at HOK. We actually go out into the community and try and engage with the young and try and bring them into our offices and try and make them aspiring architects because that's the only way we can try and bridge that, 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 that gap. I've got one more, one more for my... Okay. Well, um, three questions. <laughs> <laughs> one, one. Well, I did, huh? We one, can three take questions. it, yeah, what, uh, what? Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing is that uh, an answer to sustainability, like monumental buildings are interesting because they are sustainable, because we don't have to build it every 50 years. That's interesting, they can just renew, they are like a palimpsest, so they don't have to look green so as to be like a sustainable. And second uh, a, a question is, can we build with stone? Can we uh, build masonry anymore? Do we have like the technique, do we have the technology? We, well, we all know thermal mass buildings, we should be, and maybe we actually have to go back to building with stone. Yeah. I mean, like a load uh, bearing structures yeah. with stone, yeah. Absolutely, we? well, yeah. you know, Adams, Cara, Taylor, they've, one of my favorite structural firms, they do it. I think we've got to go back to looking how we can try and create thermal mass and thermally efficient buildings using stone. But it, it, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'd if, love to. If it I, makes I, sense in terms of uh, cost efficiency, etc. And, 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 and those, those are the questions process. and those are the answers that we have to come up with. How can we make it affordable as well? A third question after. Okay, afterwards. Thank you very much. First of all, I think his presentation was really provocative. Uh, secondly, I want to say I'm not an architect, so I'm speaking with no professional hat on in that sense. But as, as someone who inhabits London on a daily basis, I think we're already seeing the, a, a new sense of what perhaps civic means. Um, I think there's some great examples of, for example, cultural institutions who are opening up their spaces. Uh, the one that comes to mind, I think, is the Royal Opera House, their recent open up project where they completely transformed the entrance to, to the theatre. Um, you know, there's some examples, for example, Cold Drops Yard and near Granary Square. Um, and of course, there's retail and the shopping. Um, but that, that, that's a huge gesture towards a big public space where there's no traffic, where people can congregate and inhabit and just be. And yeah, I think we are seeing a, a, a continuing, perhaps a, a developing notion of what civic arch architecture means. I used to work very near King's Cross and we were part of something called the Knowledge Quarter, which was uh, a, a group of organ organizations all within one square mile of King's Cross and St Pancras, but knowledge and cultural institutions. And so we were very much part of that ongoing conversation about the development in the area. And uh, I, still, I remember seeing one of the original, the, what, the model box for, for the whole Grand New Square development. And uh, what's so amazing now is that what seemed just, what was the beginning of an idea even five, six years ago, no, 10 years ago, it's now concrete. And the new generation of young, for example, young students maybe come to study in London in that area. For them, they won't be able to imagine that that was never there. Whereas for us, <laughs> we're old crusties, we, we remember what that area was like before. Uh, and so the, the transformation of these public spaces is, is astonishing. And, and if I may add one other thought uh, that occurred to me uh, after Femi finished was, Sweden has already introduced, I think, a four day working week as an experiment. I think, I think the Labour Party, I think, recently was, was um, 
talking about this notion of introducing a four-day working week, you know, as artificial intelligence transforms, you know, the workplace and our leisure lives, you know, we may have more time when we're not in the office or not, not at work. And I think there may be more demand for, again, for these public spaces where people can come together. And so we don't remain digitally isolated uh, in the virtual world. But actually, you know, there's something really important about having spaces where we can come together to talk, to play, just to be.